Thank you very much, Dan. And I believe, Aaron, that I did the right touch here. So, almost, okay. So, <clears throat> why don't you come and set me straight, thank you. So I just wanted to, to let you know, anticipate for tomorrow, because tomorrow in the afternoon at, <clears throat> at 1.45, we're gonna be having some micro sessions, and those are opportunities to follow up on some of these uh, presentations that have been given to us. It's gonna be an opportunity to follow up tomorrow on the presentation that we're about to receive, but also there's gonna be an opportunity for a session on connecting research with industry needs. And uh, Zach Wilkinson and Dan Hubert from our staff, our technology transfer staff, we might have to change the name, thank you, Dr. White, and uh, their staff as well, will be together to talk about real examples of commercialization happening with Alaskan companies. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Commissioner Susan Bell. Commissioner, <clears throat> she's the Commissioner of the Department of Commerce, Community, and Economic Development. Born in Nome and raised in Fairbanks, Commissioner Bell has been a Southeast Alaska resident for over 25 years. She's held various senior level business management and marketing positions in Alaska, and understands the challenges faced by communities and small business in Alaska. She serves as the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority and the Alaska Energy Authority, and a State Co-Chair of the Federal Denali Commission and is a member of the Alaska Railroad Board of Directors. It's my pleasure to introduce Commissioner Bell. And in turn, it's my pleasure to present our speaker this evening, but before I do, I, um, first of all, want to recognize a couple people that I work very closely with. Rachel Bilesma, who's up in the front. She's the, in the governor's office, and she's a special assistant for the Department of Commerce. And I want you to know that um, if you have ideas, if you have issues, you can always contact me. You can always contact Rachel. And then Lorene Palmer, who we stole from the Juneau Convention and Visitor Bureau in late November. She serves as the director of the Division of Economic Development. She'll be um, representing the department tomorrow afternoon on the panel. and. Uh, and I've already given my uh, apologies and asked forgiveness because as soon as I make this introduction, I'm going to be stepping away from the forum, but I will be, um, I will be stepping back into the conference as will Loreen and Rachel. So um, just briefly, because I have the microphone, I want to make one statement about our department. We are quite a large department, 13 different agencies, and we work to address the high cost of energy to help strategically enhance infrastructure development, including roads, ports, railroad, communications, particularly through the Division of Economic Development and ASME, but through an array of other programs, we work to create market demand, connecting our Alaska businesses with national and international markets, and we're really working, particularly through our regulatory and consumer protection entities, to provide a business climate that's attractive and conducive to job creation and investment. My ears perked up when Dan said that they had filed the uh, incorporation paperwork, which that's part of our division. I quickly looked over to Adam and said, how long have we had that paperwork? So <laughs> that's what, only two weeks, we'll, uh, we'll turn that. Um, but again, it's a, it's a big department. We work really closely um, with the university and with many businesses in the region and throughout the state. Um, and I, I look forward to um, taking in as much of the conference as I can. So to our main speaker, Jim Kastama, I had a chance to spend nearly an hour with him this morning. I know he's very passionate about what he's going to be sharing through the next 40, 24, 48 hours with us. And I'm gonna read a little bit about his background. He was selected by Seattle Magazine as one of the most influential people in Washington State for 2012. He chaired the Senate Economic Development Trade and Innovation Committee in Washington State for six years. In this role, he established the uh, Washington's Economic Development Commission with a 10-year strategic focus on innovation. He also is particularly noted for his work in Innovation Partnership Zones, IPZs. He spent a lot of time um, thinking about economic development and one of his hallmarks is really connecting Washington State's university's commercialization efforts with the business community. He authored legislation establishing Washington's first virtual university, WGU Washington. In terms of uh, his recognition, the Council of State Governments in 2012 awarded an innovation award, uh, award for the creation of I these IPZs. 
He's also represented the state of Washington on trade and cultural missions to China, Taiwan, Japan, and Turkey. He's active with Penmore, the Pacific Northwest Economic Region. We'll be hosting that conference in Alaska this summer, for those of you who are interested. Uh, some other things, again, um, just some of the highlights. He was, he was responsible for com combining two state agencies into Innovate Washington, a single agency committed to the transfer of technology from universities to companies. So again, building on, on the kinds of um, things that Dan was just sharing with us, or Professor, Dr. White, and too informal. A couple of personal notes before I relinquish the podium. Uh, uh, Senator Kastama studied political science and economics. He competed in intercollegiate bicycle racing. He's a volunteer at Crystal Mountain Ski Patrol. He has worked with a number of nonprofits um, in his community. He's been a director at Community and Schools. And it's my pleasure to ask him to the podium and welcome Mr. James Kastama. Susan, thank you very much for that introduction. I appreciate it very much. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Good to be here in Juneau. Um, this, um, at the beginning of today's um, conference, I was taken by Edward Thomas's discussion about the impact of innovation that it had on many of the people that he grew up around, many of his friends, family members, etc. And it got me thinking a little bit about how to fully actualize a person's potential. That's what I thought when I was listening to that. To not respond to innovation, but instead to be the innovator. And it reminded me a story of my father, and I'll share with that with you. My dad grew up in northern Minnesota, and he was um, probably not the best student. In fact, I think I learned that his GPA in high school was a D minus. Now, I didn't even know that's possible. Um, but I know that he spent all his time on his way to school uh, checking the traps. And I know sometimes he wouldn't come back. He would be gone for two, three days with his best friend playing hooky. Well, my father later on went into the Air Force. And when he got out, he had the GI Bill and he wanted to go to college. He had two children, another one on the way, married. And he went to the university and they wouldn't let him in. They said, listen, you really don't have the background. Uh, you're not made the, for, of the right stuff to go to college. Well, through a process, he was eventually able to get in, and he received a, a bachelor's degree, a master's, a PhD, and was a college professor, and has probably wrote, written, I think, three books right now, and came out with some of the most innovative correction policy my state has ever seen. And it reminds you of the tremendous human potential for innovation that's out there amongst all of us. And that with the right kind of an investment, we can make it happen. It kind of renews my faith in human potential, actually. Um, one thing that Susan didn't mention to you is that I'm no longer a state senator. I was in the legislature for 16 years, but I just recently retired, and that's been a little bit of a transition for me. Uh, my children tell me uh, they're very glad to see me, which is very nice, because uh, usually I'm gone. The community that I grew up in, Puyallup, the one I have represented, they're not used to seeing me around the town that much. Um, I'm often mistaken, and I don't know if you see this, I don't necessarily see it, but I'm often mistaken for Sam Waterston. He's an actor on Law and Order, okay? So I'm at this McDonald's right close to my house the other day, and this woman walks up to me and she says, you look, you're just a spitting image of that guy. And I go, I know, I know. The guy on Law and Order, she goes, no, no, you're the spitting image of that Senator Castama. So I had to tell her that was me. So my community is getting used to me again. Um, I have a passion for economic development. You heard that I went to China in 2006, or that I went to China. It was actually in 2006. I accompanied the governor on a trade mission there. Now, I had read The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman. I know many people have read that. But the image of China in my mind with the ox carts and bicycles, it just stuck. That's what I thought I was going to see. But instead, of course, I saw the skyscrapers. I saw the entrepreneurship. I saw 500 million people coming out of poverty in a relatively short historic time. And it shocked me. I came back and I, feel as if, I felt as if I had just seen the future. 
that that's where the world was going to go, and it really shocked me. So I did a little bit of investigating because I had the image that we're number one, the United States is number one. But then this think tank out of Washington, D.C. did a study where they looked at 16 different indicators with 40 different countries and regions, and they ranked the United States on how we were doing in all of those. And they came to the conclusion, actually, I'll let you look at those real quick, but they came to the conclusion that we were number six, okay? Not as good as I thought. But what was really troubling was the trend. In other words, all of those indicators for economic success in the future, where are they going in the United States? Well, here's how we fared. We were behind the top 14. We were behind the top 27. In fact, in trend lines, what's going to happen in the future, we were dead last. So I came, became very motivated, and I went back to my state. And one of the things that I first noticed is we didn't have an economic development strategy. There was no strategy for the entire state. In fact, I counted probably 10 to 15 different economic strategies, but not one that the entire state could rally behind and align our resources. The governors had dabbled, that I had dealt with, had dabbled with clusters. We had dabbled with business roundtables, with tax incentive packages. But these changed every time a new governor came about or every time a new agency director came about. And so it carried very little credibility or no credibility in the state. So the first thing that I did, my committee did, was we created the Washington State Economic Development Commission to create a strategy. The commission is very unique. It's a private-public partnership with 24 members, mostly private, and private are the only ones that can vote on it. But let me, um, between us in this room, let me tell you why I created the commission to make the strategy. I wanted to protect the strategy from people like me, okay? I wanted to protect the strategy from politicians. Now, I've been elected five times, but I have to tell you, we usually have a two- to four-year window. That is really the extent that we look out to the next election cycle. I knew that for a strategy to be effective, you had to look at least 10 years out, and I need someone who would do that. I also wanted to insulate this strategy from special interest groups, because special interest groups, almost by definition, they're very narrow, focused, and also they're very much embedded in the status quo and unwilling to change oftentimes. And I needed someone to give a very full, kind of open perspective to a strategy. My objective was this. I wanted a respected strategy that was intellectually honest, could withstand scrutiny, and then here's probably the toughest one of all. I wanted it applicable everywhere throughout Washington State. Well, the first strategic document that we put forward focused on innovation, kind of an audacious goal to make Washington State the most attractive, creative, fertile investment environment for innovation in the world. Now, Brian already talked to, talked to you about innovation and the attributes of innovation, and you're all here at a conference for innovation, but let me just share with you here why innovation is so important. Two-thirds of GD GDP growth comes from innovation. The pay in areas that actually innovate is 70% higher than other industries. The social return on your dollars is two to, two to four times that, the private return, and it helps you, the state, government, with huge cost drivers like healthcare and education. So innovation is really where it's at. But I want to dispel some myths about innovation, and this is what I constantly deal with innovation. First, that it only deals with technology you know, information technology, computers, things of that sort. In our state, some of our biggest successes have been in food processing, agriculture, viticulture, that's wine, by the way. We are now the second largest wine producer in the United States, and paper products. Food processing has actually added jobs during this recession because they've come up with new products, innovative products. Like when you go to McDonald's and you get that Happy Meal with those sliced apples, that's a value-added product, a new product that they've come up with. The paper products industry now laminates paper to make countertops and anti-ballistic material. They go ahead and laminate Kevlar on top of that for anti-ballistic material and sell it to the Defense Department. 
what you soon discover is that innovation is really about problem solving. And I want to emphasize that. It's about problem solving. New solutions for the market, ideas actually implemented. The second myth about innovation is that it's top down. It's decided by very few people, and then it's implemented from that point down. Well, I want you to know, in Washington State, our goal has been to engage people from all parts of the state and all different levels. And a good example, I know we've talked about a lot about clusters, but I want to share with you our cluster strategy. It's called the Innovation Partnership Program. Again, our cluster program. In the, in the past, the way they would identify clusters is they would look at the businesses or resources or all of those different factors around a particular industry or technology. And if there was sufficient mass, we would say there is a cluster. Well, this time, we completely turned the process upside down. We happen to let everyone apply. Okay? Everyone apply from all over the state, rural, suburban, urban areas, they could all apply. But this is what we required of them. They had to put together a business plan, a four-year business plan, that included all the government entities, the workforce, the education providers, and the businesses. They had to sit down, write a business plan with clear goals and outcomes. And we also required them to partner with a research university. We still required that they use data to justify that, in fact, they had an industry full of focus or technology. The change has been significant in our state. No one was used to looking at clusters as a relationship first, a relationship first, and an industry or technology second. It's been dramatic. We have 15 innovation partnership zones in Washington state. Our greatest economic growth is in these areas, the highest wages, more patents. One entity, you'll see them, number one, Auburn, just in the application process alone, because they brought all these parties together, they say it added 1,000 jobs to their particular area. One of the IPZs, the Bothell Biomedical Manufacturing Zone, is so proud that on the side of one of our major freeways, there's a sign that says, you're entering the Bothell Biomedical Manufacturing Innovation Zone. And so convinced they are they that it's the collaboration that makes it all fly, the IPZs are now collaborating with each other, believing that when you cross-pollinate the IPZs is where you get a heightened level of innovation. So we didn't know we had all of this talent in our state. In fact, one of the greatest compliments was by the Small Business Administration Regional Director who looked at this and said, I had no idea that we had so many industries in our state. And again, as was mentioned, it received a national award for that program. Now, this second, actually, um, model that was put out by the Economic Development Com Commission just came out. This came out a month ago. And this is their new strategy. If you look on your table, I provided you kind of a cheat sheet of some of those aspects of it. But this basically tells you the difference between the old model and the new model that we, in fact, are advocating in Washington State. It calls for the great reset in the economic policy. This chart shows some key differences. Notice the policy is now you invest in talent and ideas, not in company relocation activities. Organic, long-term growth, not top-down, short-term fixes like we see out of Washington, D.C. usually. And collaboration instead of competition and I'm going to go into that uh, towards the end of, of tonight's discussion, where I talk about that collaboration. The report also identified five key drivers of innovation, and I've included these on your table. Um, you can go, in, I will go into more detail about these tomorrow at the micro sessions, and you can take that with you, but I do want to touch on them briefly. The five innovation drivers, a good recipe for an innovation economy. The first one is talent and workforce. Here's the problem we're trying to solve in Washington State. Our data shows that 67% of the jobs in the future are going to require a post-secondary education of some kind. Yet only 40% of our folks in our state have that. 
So we have to fill that gap. The truth of the matter, if you don't have the talented workers in the future, your companies are not going to grow, you're not going to attract companies to your area, and they won't stay. The second area is investment. We have to make sure that budding entrepreneurs who have great ideas can make it past that valley of the death into the marketplace, and that our universities are hiring what we call entrepreneurial researchers who start companies or create new technologies for existing companies. The third area, infrastructure. We've got to make sure that we're building an infrastructure for this century and not the last century. Anticipate higher energy costs. Anticipate the need for lab facilities at your universities. We've gotten tremendous return on that. For freight mobility to enhance trade, for broadband to link Alaska to the rest of the world. The fourth area is actually smart regulation. I don't want you to think we're going to add regulation. Did we receive an earful of this? We went ahead and we questioned, we, we pulled about 650 businesses in Washington State, and this one really came up as a very high priority. It's not so much that businesses today object to the outcomes of regulations, but they object to the process of getting there. It's so cumbersome oftentimes getting to that end result. So we've recommended that we apply LEAN, which is Toyota's process enhancement method, vigorously on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. And we've also advised that the state come up with a concierge or a broker or a connector service to help businesses basically navigate through that um, entire you know, aspect of the regulations. And then finally, trade. 95% of our business is outside of the United States. That's where the population lies, and that's where the potential lies. We recommend trade outreach, international collaborations, and that even small companies, when they start up, need to be thinking about export. And this actually brings me to the last section here, and I think one of the most important points of tonight's discussion. This is the Pacific Northwest Economic Region. Uh, how many in this room know that you're part of that? Okay, all right, well good. It consists of five states and five provinces, and if you added up all the GDP, we're the 14th largest economy in the world. It's a powerhouse. Um, the Economic Development Commission has seen that in the future, economies will be far more regional and wants to connect Washington and Penwar as a regional economy. And I was asked by Penwar to actually do an asset inventory of this entire area. And I won't go into real, you know, tiny details, but it included R&D labs, patents per capita, it dealt with workforce education levels, venture capital sources. And I put together this elaborate inventory of both five states and five provinces. And then the Economic Development Commission asked experts from around the world to come to the Fairmont Hotel in downtown Seattle. And they examined the metrics that I prepared for them. And it really surprised me what their, res what their conclusion was. They were impressed. I mean, it was good to see all the different metrics. But this was their conclusion. Every one of them, all eight experts, said, it's not the sum of the parts that matter. It's the connection between all of your innovation assets that matter the most. And the areas that master this, that have an esprit de corps, that connect all of their resources, perform much better than areas that don't. In fact, the point was that teamwork wins the race. And I thought to myself, what would happen if every state and province in the Pacific Northwest had the ability to see and connect with every strength, every one of the capacities and assets inherent in this region? Can you imagine what would happen if we actually connected all of our resources? Now, I know some of you, again, have probably read the book, The World is Flat. Well, there's another theory out there that the world is spiked. You have areas of very good success in other areas that don't have success. 
And one thing that I've dealt with in economic development is I've dealt with rivalries, people feeling jealous of areas that are spiked. They say, well, they're getting way too much money, they're too successful, um, and then they basically try to do something to hamper them or inhibit them from growing. And I would invite you to look at the spike world because I think it is spiked. And I would like to invite you to look at the world differently. I would invite you to look at those spikes as fountains. When you see the University of Washington being the number one public research facility in the country with a billion dollars that they're receiving, don't look at them as a competitor or with envy. Look at that as a fountain, a resource that you can link up to, partner with, collaborate with, and benefit and help grow yourself. Juno, Alaska can do that. It can partner with many of the other entities out there, many other educational institutions and states who do want to partner. I, um, in my travels, I have come to believe that the world is so dynamic, I really believe this, that centers of innovation can shift quickly for those who have the right strategy. My hope is Alaska can be one of those centers and that Juno can be the next cool place to be. The future, I believe, is in our hands, and I've always said to everyone, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Thank you very much. So any questions you have? They say the Pacific Northwest. Interesting about that, um, the, um, the Penn War is a very healthy organization, been around for over 20 years. It's very unique across the entire border, United States and, and Canada. Um, but they tend to look at the Seattle area settlement, the Seattle metro area as really being kind of the hub of innovation. And, um, and I think that they're fairly open to that collaborative spirit. We've got to figure out, though, this is what you have to do. You've got to figure out the platform. Uh, the IPZs, for example, they don't, they don't have a universal platform, but it would be good if they did. It would allow other areas who have clusters, for example, to use the same platform and to collaborate. Uh, ultimately, I think the way you optimize the economic effectiveness of this entire region is by having those clusters and having them connect with each other. We have seen some of the greatest innovation come when dissimilar clusters meet with each other, advanced materials with viticulture. I mean, what would you think would come out of something like that? But you would be surprised because people take for granted certain technologies or certain ideas in one area, and they are, you know, they're 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 game changing in other areas. Yes. Would you comment on the importance of taxation policy as it impacts innovation? Well, um, interesting. When I first came to the legislature, I was not on the Economic Development Committee, but I spent a lot of time with businesses. And when we polled them, taxes, regulation were always close to the, the top of the list. Um, we have seen that change dramatically since the recession. Now, across the board, even in rural areas, they're talking about workforce. Um, not that those issues aren't important. I think they are important. Um, but, you know, we have taken the attitude that we don't want to be the lowest cost place to be. Kind of the race to the bottom. Um, there are other states who are doing that, and in my opinion, I can't win at that war, okay? because South Carolina can beat us, they'll always lower the taxes. But ultimately, when I traveled around the United States, I, I often travel around the United States, I saw a situation in San Diego where, where Pfizer was closing down many of its facilities, but a very expensive facility was being left open. And I asked, you know, you're closing all these facilities, how come you're, clo how come you're keeping this one open? And the response was, that's where we get all our ideas. Companies, to be competitive, 
need to innovate. You talk to any CEO and they'll probably tell you that within five years, only 40% of their current product mix will be there at that time. They got to create about 60% of the products. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to create an environment where we provide that a higher value, okay? Um, we don't have an income tax in Washington State. I hope it stays that way, okay? Um, I hope that we renew our research and development tax, okay? So I think that's important. But um, is I, I just don't think that can be the primary driver anymore. There's far more important things. Thank you. Uh, I have to be careful with this question, considering I'm surrounded by it, this uh, wonderful table. Very wonderful people. But uh, can you, uh, can you, and the Forest Service is doing a magnificent job putting on this summit, but can you <laughs> tell me some of your experiences and how the regulatory system can help uh, uh, stir innovation and economic development? And we're seeing it here, but some of your own experiences. I'm not sure I answer, uh, understand the question. The regulatory system itself can spur innovation? Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at a, a uh, yeah, the regulatory system. How can it become involved in helping, helping develop innovation and bringing it? Well, I, I think what, through what, your what you're experience. talking about there is, you know, there's, there's different innovative ways of, again, agreeing on the outcome. And this is what the, we're trying to do in the lean process, agree on the outcome, but become innovative in the process itself of how you get there. Um, one thing I notice about regulation, and I can, I can talk uh, you know, extensively about the background information on this, but I, I notice that we are oftentimes so per procedurally prescriptive when there's another way of arriving at the very same conclusion that we forestall all innovation in the regulatory process on how to get there. Because again, we're very tied into the actual process itself. When I think what we're trying to do is get to the point, what are you trying to accomplish here? And what are some alternative methods of doing that? Um, I could go into one detail, um, one experience that I've had with air quality, for example. You have all of these different programs dealing with air quality and there may be a way to prioritize funds here to get the greatest impact out of all of it, but I've got programs though that they say, I'm sorry, they're vertically focused, they're siloed, and we will not use any funds here and put them into another program where the net effect will be greater. I mean, that's just one example. And a good one. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about Washington's experience with a, what for us in this community has become a STEM factory, which is the Southeast Alaska Regional Science Fair. It's an extraordinary collaboration of sponsors, funders, university people, scientists, engineers, judges. I just got an email that said this year's science fair is gonna be a record breaker in student turnout. Over 150 students and projects for a town of 30,000 people in this region, that's pretty big. Have you had a similar experience with, with uh, science fairs as a STEM factory in the state of Washington and a, and a collaboration engine? Thanks. We have um, the robotics program. I just happen to sit on the, the Washington First Board of Directors. Our robotics program, I thought we had the best robotics program, by the way, in the country. Um, but you actually have a very good robotics program. But our goal, by the way, is that 100% of our schools in Washington State, 100% of the school districts, have actually access to the robotic programs. It's catching on more and more, uh, the whole STEM focus. But let me introduce another letter to that, and, and that is STEAM. Okay, you've probably heard that, but you add arts into the equation. Um, and, and when people hear that, when they say, you know, that I'm now going to introduce arts into the whole STEM, is they all at that point think, well, then that must mean that the STEM is no longer important. And it's like, no, no, there's balance here. I was back in, uh, in Georgia, Georgia Tech, and I was talking to a valedictorian there who said he could no longer get into Georgia Tech. Now, this was the number one graduate of Georgia Tech. And he said he could no longer, if he applied now, get in because they changed the entrance requirements that you not only had to be good in science and math, which is important, 
but you had to play a musical, musical instrument in a sport, okay? Because this boils down to the whole concept of innovation. This is what they told me. They said that if they had to compete with China on just STEM alone, okay, compete with China and India, they put out a million engineers a year combined. Now, they're not all world class, but you get the idea, a lot of them. The United States, far smaller than that. And they said, if we had to compete purely on that level, we're going to lose. We want problem solvers. We want people to work in teams. We want them to have diverse backgrounds, right brain and left brain, fully activated. Uh, so they take people with experiences that are rather esoteric, but they bring them all together because they say, when you hire a Georgia Tech graduate, you know you're getting a problem solver. So um, I don't know if I'm answering your question enough other than to say this. I think one of the ways that you can spur this kind of cultural change, I find that young children are very um, receptive to innovation and creativity. And they come up with all of these ideas. The idea of a challenge, putting a grand challenge out there, getting people used to solving problems, especially in teams, would be a, a very valuable thing that would change, I think, the culture. Um, anyway, that's my perspective. While we're waiting to the next question, I just want to say, regarding first, very proud that we uh, have the, in Alaska, have the highest participation rate of any state in the nation. So we're really proud of the program. Thank Good you. for you. So three of the five drivers, it seemed to me, if you think of talent, workforce, investment, infrastructure, all depend on, in some ways, some kind of mixture of government and private investment. You know, and so what's what's your what what do you see as Washington? What's the what's the right mix of that kind of that kind of uh, you know partnership between government and private sector? Well, I think that. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, on the innovation partnerships, I'm going to use that as an example. I was asked by a applicant, potential applicant, to come in. I wrote the bill. So they, the city of Tacoma said, we want to be an IPZ. So we came in, and there were 20-some people in the room. And I asked, OK, how many people are here from the private sector? OK, there wasn't one entity who was there from the private sector. Private sector creates the jobs. They've got to give relevancy to this. Um, it's important in your workforce that you know basically what the needs are of your businesses so you can line them behind. People tend to think that is you're going to create uh, kind of a technical college if, if that's what you do. Fact of the matter, businesses are indicating to me they want problem solvers, critical thinkers. You know, they want people who know STEM, things of, of that source that sort. So um, I think that if you do look, however, at what we spend money on, when people think that government doesn't play a role in economic development, I mean, think of all the money you put into K-12 education and public higher education. You should be getting the full benefit, and private sector should be involved on those discussions. Um, when you look at the investment, the transportation infrastructure, you know, until about I, I want to say three years ago, we didn't even have economic development in the transportation statute as a consideration of projects. So you're funding you know, projects that relieve commuting on some farming road way out in the middle of nowhere. OK, you're spending hundreds of millions in our area on those types of things. And you're leaving ports without the adequate infrastructure, bridges, et cetera so that freight can go in out and out of those um, because you're not looking at the long-term economic development. So we've covered two so far. In every single one of those areas, government plays a role. And if you just look around the rest of the world, governments, you know, I was just sitting um, next to a gentleman who talked about his experience with Singapore. Talk about the government involvement there with Biopolis and all that they're doing. I mean, that's really, that's your competition. So the idea that hands off, um, that the government doesn't play a role in strategically aligning all these things, y you're not going to be competitive. You will not be competitive. I firmly believe that.
Thank you, Senator Costomo. You bet.